My name's Anna Eirich, and I'm going to be the MC for this landscape talk. So, ideas are the currency of the 21st century, and there's nothing more inspiring than bold ideas being presented by great speakers. So, as we're eating our lunch and as we're sitting here, we have the pleasure to listen to six extraordinary speakers today who are going to tell us about new ideas, cool ideas, and breakthrough research in the area of sustainable landscapes. So before we get started with this little panel, or little discussion, we have some ground rules. So each of the panelists was told that they have one rule that they have to follow, and that is that they're not allowed to use PowerPoints. So they're allowed to use visual aids, but no PowerPoints, because we want this to be an engaging session, uh, and we want it to be fun. So the second rule that the, each of the speakers has is that they have a limit of seven minutes. So I will have a timer here, and Lindsay will also have a timer, and if they go over, we'll try to hurry them up so they get off the stage within seven minutes. And the third rule is for you, for the audience. So the rule is that we want you to engage. We want you to applaud our speakers and make them feel welcome here on the stage, but we also encourage you to participate using Slido, and you can use the code THINKLANDSCAPE. So, Without further ado, it's my honor and pleasure to invite Seth Seamus, who is the direct Director of Innovation and Policy Markets for Eco Agriculture Partners, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the Landscape Investment Tool and the Finance Tool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I am honored. My name is Seth Seamus uh, from Eco Agriculture Partners to be the first of the the bold, innovative speakers giving a great talk. So welcome here to the, landscape, to the Landscape Talks at the Global Landscape Forum. And so I thought that it would be appropriate to start this talk off with a picture of a landscape. And I think that since you all are, can you hear me if I just talk through here? No? Okay, um, since you all are here at the Global Landscapes Forum, you probably have some sense of how different types of land uses are related in a landscape. So you could see, you probably have a sense of how a forest is related to uh, an agricultural field and how that can be related to a city from a, an ecological or an agricultural perspective. But um, I think what we don't have a lot of experience in or less experience than we do ecologically is how these uh, investments relate in the landscape. Um, the fact that there is deforestation upstream that uh, reduces the return profile for that hydropower plant that's in the foreground. Uh, that hydropower plant doesn't control all of the different land, land uses and the, the pieces of land within that landscape, so they must rely on other actors, other stakeholders within the landscape. And so at Eco Agriculture Partners, we talk about this process of working with a variety of stakeholders towards common objectives at a landscape scale is integrated landscape management. So our hypothesis a few years ago, along with many others, are that we need to understand better the financial system and the investment system within a landscape context. So that understanding led to uh, a, a, a diagram like this. So this is kind of how we see a financial system in a landscape. So we have sources of finance, different kinds. So these are for-profit and these are non-for-profit sources. Um, we have foundations, we have local banks, we have companies, public agencies, even institutional investors, and those sources um, finance activities on the ground that we would distinguish, you know, asset investments, specific real things that are happening like agroforestry systems or agro-processing plants, as well as enabling investments. So those governance investments and those capacity building investments, they create the conditions for, for the, the, uh, the asset investments. So, but what distinguishes a landscape thinking from a financial perspective is not just that you, there's an investment in a single you know, agroforestry farm, for example, but there, there's a, a coordination element that all these investments are working together towards common goals, that there's, there's a spatial coordination, there's sequencing of investments, there's certain enabling investments that come before asset investments. So <clears throat> what we began to discover is that there was a lot, a huge gap in capacities to, to coordinate investments at a landscape scale. So the kind of cone at the top of that, that diagram is 
kind of a landscape investment facilitation function that can do this coordination at a landscape scale. But there was not a lot of this happening. So what we thought would be useful is to create a tool for this type of coordination entity. And that's how we get, got to the landscape investment in finance tool. So here it is, so Lyft. So in a, from an immediate perspective, what Lyft does is take la multi-stakeholder landscape groups um, on a process of translating their joint visions, their joint action plans from uh, a vision to specific investable ideas. And when we say investable, that can mean you know, business for profit ideas, but, but also enabling you know, ideas. So we had experiences at Eco Agriculture Partners for many years where we'd work with these multi-stakeholder platforms and they'd say, okay, you know, we got it. We know what we have to do. We're going to restore this riparian area. You know? um, and then you kind of drill down a little bit and say, well, what, what does that mean? You know, who's going to do it? You know, who's going to pay for it? And um, you know, it's hard to get deep. So this, this tool is to try to get deep, to translate these ideas into, into business, I, business plans and to then identify appropriate sources of finance. So they know that what is a, what is a private sector function versus what is a public sector function. So this is, um, and by the way, I'll, I'll tell you what, this is all available now. Um, it's split up, Lyft is split up into two documents right now. So there's the primer, which lays out the conceptual foundation for, for uh, integrated landscape investments, which includes answers to questions like, what is integrated landscape management? How can you produce financial value from landscape action? What are different ways of blending finance? How can finance be coordinated at a landscape scale? And this material is referred back to throughout the process, the sort of Lyft process. Um, and the manual is the kind of the step-by-step -step of all of this. Um, that goes on over you know, a long period of time. This isn't something that you go and give a workshop to in a weekend and it's all done. You know, this can take a year, two years, many years. Um, so it's split up into three stages. The first is assessing financing needs of priority investments in the landscape plan. And um, this is essentially the, the moment where landscape initiatives clarify their business ideas. And we have a variety of tools and worksheets in that process, you know, agendas for, work, for workshops to go through that process. This is just an example. Don't try to read this. Some of you may be familiar with the business model canvas. This is something that's you know, taught in business schools to um, get people to clarify business ideas, value proposition, costs, benefits. So we've kind of created a version of this that's a bit more landscapey that, um, that that entrepreneurs or, or you know, partnerships can fill out as they, they clarify ideas. The second part of uh, the tool is the one in which um, you try to identify specific sources of finance for your idea. Um, there are a, there's a lot of, of challenges with you know, financial literacy in the, the places where we work. People don't know what's available or know kind of what to look for, how to look for it. So this takes them through a process of figuring out what is most appropriate and then also um, accessing information for you know, specific, specific investors. So for example, something we might go through is to figure out you know, where do you sit, the type of finance you need, um, how, what is the deal size, what is the risk return profile, um, how much time do you need in order for this investment to be paid back? And depending on where you are, you would ident identify yourself and say, oh, you know what, actually what I'm looking for is something that is more appropriate for a local bank. Or maybe what I'm looking for is something for Althelia, an impact investor. Um, sort of start there and then uh, we have mechanisms to kind of access more specific information. Finally, um, um, the initial kind of wave, wave of potential investments that comes through this, this the first use of Lyft, um, you know, has these experiences, and there's a process of kind of reporting back, exchanging information, deciding as a group, um, are we going to kind of go our own separate ways with these investments, and then try a new wave of investments? Have we come up against barriers that we need to address as a group? Do we uh, are land tenure issues so um, so intractable in this place that we need to develop an advocacy campaign before any of these 
uh, investments are going to work. So it's a, it's a check in time and a, a plan to develop a more comprehensive strategy and potentially kind of start the process all over again. So um, we've tested this now, and I should say also, we, this has been done in, in collaboration with IUCN Netherlands, um, and we've tested this in three landscapes, in the Philippines, Honduras, and Tanzania, and there's a plan to roll it out um, in a larger way in eight to 10 landscapes this next year in partnership with IUCN Netherlands. I actually just spoke to a colleague at the Conservation International that, that, that says that they're now using this lift tool, and we have some other partners as well who are very interested. What we'd love to do is create a community of practice around this tool so um, we can all learn from each other over time. So if you're interested in that or learning more, please talk to me. My name is Seth, um, or go to liftkit.info. Uh, another colleague, Lewis Wirtz, is here too, and he'd be happy to talk to you about this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seth. All right, next up, we have Christian de Valle, and he's speaking uh, about delivering scalable and replicable finance in natural capital. And Christian is the founder and manager of Althelia Climate Fund. Welcome, Christian. Thank you very much. Hello, and happy lunchtime. Um, good news is um, I've got a movie for you today, so... Um, we're not going to get to find out too much whether I'm the extraordinary speaker that I was billed as. I, I, would, I wouldn't want to disappoint you, but um, I'm going to speak quickly, um, and uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll show the movie. Um, normally, I start with um, positive stuff and move on to negative or cynical things just to challenge us all. But, um, I was told that these landscape talks, because they're taking place over lunch, need to be somewhat positive. So I'm going to start with the cynicism, and then I'll move to the positive. But... Um, I mean, I think it's really important for us every time we come to a session like this, whether it's a GLF or a COP or anything else, a, a CBD COP, is to realize that we effectively, <clears throat> contextually, we're operating within a framework of failure. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, the University of Maryland just recently uh, came out with the latest figures for 2016, telling us that nearly 30 million hectares of tree cover were lost in that year. Um, that's a 51% increase on the year before, an area the size of New Zealand. So I don't want to bring you all down in your, in, over your, your lunchtime plates, but the thing is we've been doing this for 10, 12 years, coming together. I think, in my mind anyway, the trigger point was the Bally Cop. Every year we lost an area that tree, tree covered the size of England. This, so this year it's New Zealand. Okay, so let's just challenge ourselves to, um, to kind of build on the comment that Baz made in the last panel, which I really welcomed, and that is let's start making mistakes, because it's only through mistakes delivering action on the ground that we're able to learn and build. We cannot, as Barack Obama used to say, like to, uh, let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, okay, so that's enough with the cynicism. Um, um, Althelia is a disruptive business. We were set up in uh, 2011 as an impact investment, uh, investment business. In 2013, we launched the Althelia Climate Fund, which some of you might be aware of. It's about 100 million euros. Um, uh, committed to 11 or 12 investments globally, mostly in Latin America. Um, in our portfolio, we've got about 200 million hectares of, of area under improved conservation and about 40,000 hectares of area under sustainable production. Those um, production, that nexus between production and um, protection, they work together like a gear. I'm going to show you what I mean by that in our little movie. Um, we're going to have a quick look at the Tambapata Biodiversity Reserve in Madre de Dios, Peru. Um, we have set up uh, in the buffer zone of that national park uh, a cocoa-based in in integrated agroforestry system that uh, not only generates big subsistence benefits for economic actors, i.e. farmers operating in the buffer zone and in the surrounding area, um, but it also facilitates um, a, 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 an economic wall, if you will, around uh, the protected area, which is um, um, covered by a, um, a Red Plus system, and I'm hoping you have a... Absolutely. So you can probably, you've been gazing at the picture there, which sort of d demonstrates some of the impacts um, that have been achieved thus far or, or that are scheduled to be achieved over the, uh, over the life of our fund and our engagement um, um, there. So those impacts, as you can see, span um, about seven different themes that we focus on, which are aligned with the uh, SDGs 
ranging from biodiversity and ecosystem services straight over to poverty alleviation, uh, inclusivity, um, uh, sustainable enterprise, of course, climate as well. Um, specifically, what we've done there at Tambapata, um, we've involved about 350 farmers, most of, who, uh, most of whom are a member uh, of a cooperative, COPASAR, that was set up and formalized with legal accounting and administrative documentation. Um, we've installed thus far just under 1,250 uh, hectares of uh, cocoa-based agroforestry systems, which, I, like I say, are in, operating in the buffer zone. Uh, 600 hectares of that is, uh, is grafted with fine and flavor aromatic clones mixed with, and we, we think this is very important, uh, in species of cacao indigenous to Madre de Dios. Um, we've got about 345 family nurseries installed, and quite importantly, for added value on the ground rather than outsourcing it somewhere else in the supply chain or the value chain, we've got a post-harvest processing facility that's constructed, and that post-harvesting uh, post-harvest processing facility can handle about 150 million tons uh, of wet cocoa per month which is more than we're producing right now. Uh, we've produced our first cocoa, or I shouldn't say we, uh, the, um, the project, um, which is uh, managed by our NGO partner, IDARE, has produced its uh, first cocoa and uh, should be um, um, ramping up quite steadily over the coming uh, two to three years. Um, we've got 140 uh, processors who are committed to uh, um, converting their once conventional plots over to organic. Uh, the, uh, the cooperative is fully certified to deliver fair trade and organic uh, cacao. Uh, and we've also launched with uh, support of, uh, of partners, uh, Ecotierra, a traceability tool called Minka, which is going to be very important in the future as we scale it up. So without further ado, if I can ask the, um, uh, the AV people to start the short movie so you can see what it looks like and I'll stop rambling. This was before pastures for extensive cattle ranging. And then the farmers were deforesting more and more because the soil got degraded. What we actually are doing is we partner with that farmer. And in this case, Aider is the aggregator that unites all the farmers around the venture, in this case, a cooperative of cacao, where you would earn more for three, four, five hectares of cacao rather than 10 or 20 hectares of extensive cattle. It's a $12 million investment program protecting the reserve of Tambopata, but also activities around the protected area with the target of avoiding the deforestation of 12,000 hectares of primary rainforest by 2021 and avoiding more than 4 million tons of CO2. And it's a mix between carbon credit sales and cocoa sales, which actually make the project around profitable. More than 85% than go directly to the farmers. And then the other is shared between IDER for doing more technical assistance. Another part goes to Altilis investors. Ahora, que nosotros estamos viéndolo como el proyecto está dentro de lo que es desde la plantación hasta el mercado, tiene un buen éxito. Entonces, esto es lo que voy a trasladar también a todos los que vienen atrás, los hijos y todo, que también está, porque deben sentirse orgullosos que prácticamente nosotros somos la despensa del Perú. Entonces, eso es lo que a mí me orgullece. Soy contento de lo que soy. Thank you. Yeah, we, we were fortunate enough, uh, or I dare was fortunate enough um, um, to win um, a UNF Triple C Momentum uh, for Change Award uh, for um, what's going on in the field there, and uh, we were we were you know we humbly accepted that with a lot of excitement because it uh, again um, I think it's very important when we sit in fora like this to to demonstrate what action on the ground really looks like. So what's next at Tambapata? So we've worked really hard with IDER uh, and the Peruvian authorities, um, Sarnamp and, and, and Minam, uh, so that um, this project can be fully integrated into Peru's National Red Plus uh, system and reflected in the baseline as it um, a, a, 
as it is assembled. Um, as you know, most countries are not that far along um, with, with assembling uh, and putting together these national reference levels. Very few are. Peru, happily, is, 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 is farther than most. Um, and it's a real challenge for those who want to actually be involved in action today, um, but also are committed to um, landscape level accounting. Um, so we're pretty pleased that um, we, 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 we can document, our, you doc, we have documentary evidence that this is happening and I think that it's a pathway that others can follow on, particularly in um, uh, Peru. Also exciting, um, in 2018 uh, we're working on our first cocoa exports to Europe. Um, we've prepared a long-term offtake agreement, which also is important because it's going to secure the expansion um, of the project finance structure um, in the area. And you know, I mentioned we're committed to a landscape level intervention. Um, we're working um, with our partners on the scaling up um, in two phases. So right now I mentioned we've got about, sorry for the echo. Um, Nope, okay. Sorry about the echo. We've got about um, 1,250 hectares under plantation today in the buffer zone. Um, eventually that will be scaled up uh, in phase two to 5,000 with the potential for a further 5,000 of agroforestry systems um, uh, to reinforce uh, the conservation efforts along a much longer frontier. So um, hopefully that seems like good news to you. We think it is. And uh, thank you to the GLF for giving us the opportunity to uh, tell you about, a bit about it. Thank you, Christian. Now, how can we structure landscape initiatives so that they attract new sources of finance? Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Violaine Berger of the IDH, the Sustainable Trade Initiative, to the stage to tell us about a multi-layered approach to achieving sustainable production. Great, thank you. So, um, why are we all here today? Um, I guess that most of us share the same ambition, the same vision, which is a vision of a thriving landscape, um, which is this one. A thriving landscape where human activities do not further contribute to the conversion of natural ecosystems, where human activities uh, do not contribute to deforestation, to peatland conversion, to uh, water resources depletion, etc. Further, um, our shared aspiration is certainly that human activities contribute to the conservation and restoration of these natural ecosystems because they are critical to people's well-being. And, um, well, I assume that most of us in this room are working in this space, uh, either as part of, uh, well, companies that produce the goods that we consume every day, as part of the conservation community, as part of government, and, of course, because this is the topic of this conference, as part of the investors community. But we're all here today because there's also one big challenge that we still need to address, which is how can we reach this, uh, well, vision of a thriving landscape uh, without uh, solely relying on public funding. So in other words, how should we structure our jurisdictional approaches? How should we structure our projects so that they attract new sources of investment and, uh, and that it goes really beyond public funding? So this is what we're working on at IDH, the Sustainable Trade Initiative. We've got a landscape program that we're piloting in 12 landscapes in eight countries, and we're structuring the program around the three pillars of forest protection and restoration, sustainable production of agro-commodities, but also community inclusion, social inclusion. So what does it take to build this, uh, this approach? Of course, well, when we talk about jurisdictional approaches, it's about working with multiple stakeholders, with uh, governments at a national but also jurisdictional level, with uh, companies, so with businesses, so small uh, companies, but also the big ones, the traders, uh, the retailers, with communities, farmers, NGOs, and of course, investors' community. It's also about uh, working at different scales, at a global scale. And for example, IDH with the World Cocoa Foundation, what we did is that we, we convened global cocoa companies uh, towards a joint statement of intent for, for them to eliminate deforestation in their value chain. It requires working at a national level, and we worked with the governments of Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire uh, for them to define what is the action plan to 
uh, reduce deforestation that is related to cocoa production. It requires, of course, to work at the jurisdictional level, but also at the sub-jurisdictional level, in, at the municipality level. So there's different ingredients to this, uh, to this recipe. Uh, so that the, the jurisdictional approach can attract uh, investors and new sources of funding. And I'm going to tell you about the three main ingredients that we've got. The first one is really government engagement uh, and also government commitments to sustainability targets. So here I'm taking the example of Brazil. So Brazil, uh, well, at a national level, they've got their NDC that include also uh, deforestation-related targets, so a mitigation of deforestation-related targets. At a, a provincial level, at a state level, the state of Mato Grosso has committed to very ambitious targets on production, conservation, and inclusion. So they committed to it in 2015. At the municipal level, uh, now we're working with two municipalities in Mato Grosso, and, and they've uh, also adopted some targets on production, um, conservation, and inclusion. Why is it important? Well, it gives long-term certainty. The fact that at a national level, at a provincial level, at a municipality level, there are sustainability targets, so there's a pathway towards reaching the vision. And it's extremely important to de-risk the, the investments, to de-risk the landscape. The second ingredient is a supply chain approach. It's about working with the producers on the ground. And in the municipalities of Corte de Guasu and Juruena, in the north of Mato Grosso, we're working with as a cattle rancher, so Sao Marcelo Fazendas. But we're also working with um, the mother company, with also the buyers of the beef and of the byproducts like leather, and also with the retailer. And we're creating this link between the producer and the retailer, because it's critical that you've got, well, a supply of sustainable product, but also commitments from the demand side. So this is the second ingredient. The third ingredient is about, well, what we call um, developing a production, protection and inclusion compacts, which are agreements uh, between different stakeholders at a sub-jurisdictional level, agreement on key targets that all of the stakeholders agree upon. And this is uh, actually in the municipalities of Cote d'Iguazu and Juruena. Um, these uh, compacts were recently signed on the 10th of May. And they were signed, and this is what's really interesting, not only by the mayors, but also by representatives from the timber sector, the beef sector, from settlements, um, so settlement representatives, also from uh, conservation NGOs, and all of them agreed on the set of targets. And here as well, this is important to investors, so there's a shared vision, there's shared targets that will lead to an action plan. So you know that the jurisdictions are on the right path towards sustainability. The next stage is the creation of verified sourcing areas. And it's extremely interesting because when the compacts were signed in Juruena and Contreguasu, there was really a momentum and people were like, yes, we want to create this jurisdiction where um, buyers can sustainably source their beef. And uh, this is what the verified sourcing area is about. It's creating this um, certainty that the beef that you buy from this jurisdiction is uh, produced sustainably. Also, the PPI compacts, so the Production, Protection and Inclusion Compact, uh, are the first steps towards well, developing an action plan with different buckets of actions that will need to be developed and that can help uh, attract different sources of investment. So you have the supply chain companies that want to invest in the landscape because they're interested in sourcing sustainable beef. There's also commercial banks that are interested in, in giving loans to farmers because we're helping the farmers have their uh, car validated. Uh, there's also impact investors that are interested in multilateral development banks. So we, we are able to attract different sources of funding to the landscape. So to summarize, what are the ingredients to our recipe? So it's first government engagement at different level, national, uh, provincial, and municipality level, which is key. A supply chain approach, connecting the supply to demand, and then creating this production, protection, and inclusion compact. And it really helps create these pipelines of projects that are investable. So this really helps while um, well, reaching our vision, which is this thriving landscape that I um, presented just before, where uh, really human activities are contributing to the protection and the conservation of forests. 
So I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have during one of the breaks later today. Thank you. Thank you, Viola. All right, we're sort of back on schedule. You folks are doing an excellent job of keeping in the seven minutes, thank you. Next up, we have Stephen Ramsey, or Rumsey, apologies, and he will talk to us about the next decade of Red Plus, opportunities to invest in natural forests. Stephen Ramsey is the chairman of Permian Global. Welcome. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I apologize in advance. I've got a bit of a cold, so if I start coughing, I hope I won't uh, trouble you too much. Um, I thought uh, we'd, we'd share some images um, with regard to Red Plus of kind of what it's all about, really, which is it's about emissions, avoiding disaster, and... Uh, facilitating ecosystem recovery. So uh, somebody earlier talked about uh, being a bit negative first and then positive later. Well, I apologize for the negative, but this is what it's really like. So um, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation plus, we, we still think this is really important and it's become a bit less fashionable recently, but... Um, it needs to come back because it's basically a good idea. Um, so the emissions mostly come from degradation and fire is mostly involved. And of course, fires do occur naturally in the natural environment, but we're seeing fires at the rate of five, 10, 50,000 times the rate that they would occur naturally. So it's a bit unnatural. And um, we really need negative emissions if we're going to avoid uh, disastrous climate change. So we need the opposite of what you're seeing here in these images. These are large-scale emissions uh, coming out of landscapes, causing uh, the haze. You know, this is in Southeast Asia. And um, we need the opposite. We need negative emissions. We need... We have far too much CO2 at... 411 parts per million, and we need to get that down. So we would estimate that if half the world's forests would be managed for ecosystem recovery, we'd probably see about a reduction of about three parts per million a year. So we could solve the climate change problem in about 50 years, which would probably be in line with averting a significant disaster for humanity. So we spent the last decade looking at what is actually required, working on the ground, uh, the practical challenges of Red Plus. And the, the tropics are the most vital part of the world for negative emissions because that's where we have the most rainfall and solar energy. And the method that works is to work with local communities, analyze all aspects of human interaction with forests, and facilitate the transformation of the local economy from the norm, which is, which is largely based on destruction, uh, to transform it to sustainability. The private sector is absolutely crucial in the tropics for success. I mean, I grew up in the tropics. Uh, public sector is vitally important, of course. But if you look at what actually works, it's usually the private sector. And, and so going forward, as we scale these activities up, what we need is forest conservation and food production working together in sustainable partnerships. We also need, as other speakers have said, we need to mobilize uh, private sector long-term capital. Private sector long-term capital now is about $80 trillion. It's a lot. Um, it dwarfs public sector funds. So um, getting the private sector involved in terms of long-term financing is, is really crucial. But the catch 
is private sector funding is very demanding. It's very demanding in terms of both scientific integrity and financial integrity. So, so how, do, how do we do this? Well, we're making enormous strides with remote sensing and you know, with the use of radar, for instance, the big problem that we had with tropical forests was clouds and we couldn't actually observe uh, uh, what was going on, but we now can do that with radar. We still need a combination of ground truthing, but, but satellite data is tremendously useful for auditing. And so it's, it's really difficult now to deceive people with what's going on in landscapes. The, tru the truth will out. Sorry, we've flipped now to the good bit. So this, this should be the result of a red plus at large scale. You have forests like this rather than the ones you saw earlier. So remote sensing helps, helps with auditing. Now, I was an investment manager for one of the biggest pension funds uh, in the world for nine years. And then I was a CEO of a bank for a long time. And then I created my own investment fund, which grew to $30 billion under management. So I have a lot of experience in the financial sector. And I can tell you that, um, as I said earlier, financial integrity is, is absolutely crucial. At the moment, the Red Plus market is perceived as being unregulated. I mean, that, that may or may not be true. Um, but I would predict that that's going to change fairly rapidly. And in my experience, there's not actually much difference between regulated and unregulated markets in practical terms when you're operating. It's just that in regulated markets, if you're doing something wrong, you're more likely to get caught. So dishonest behavior is mostly illegal anywhere, whether it's regulated or unregulated. And as we scale up over the next decade, we're going to need much more transparency. We're going to need markets to be properly regulated. And we need, to, we need people to take much more care about telling the truth, both in scientific, scientific and financial terms. And I'm not just talking about the private sector, I'm talking about public sector as well. I'm talking about governments. I'm talking about um, the data that, that's widely put out into the public domain. And obviously there's scope for improvement with everything. People are just going to need to be a lot more careful. So my, my view about all this is that we are actually going to succeed. We will attract the necessary long-term capital and we will avert disastrous climate change over the next 50 years. But the next decade is absolutely crucial. And in the tropics, we'll help to develop much more successful and sustainable economies, um, which is what many of the people in this room have spent much of their lives trying to do. But if we don't get it right, if we don't get our methods right by about 2030, we're going to have a real problem. So it's, it's really important that everybody starts to take it much more seriously now. We need to focus on emissions. It's fine. The methods involve other stuff. I'm, I'm a strong believer in, uh, uh, as I said earlier, we can only succeed by working with the local communities, but the focus needs to be on emissions. And I just reflect on a truism from my decades in financial markets that recovery only happens when the full extent of problems are, are truly understood and recognized. And uh, the darkest hour heralds the dawn. I think at the moment we are in the darkest hour because I sense that our, um, the people who've been working together on this in some ways have lost their way. Uh, but I think that's going to change. And I think that we're going to be really surprised about what happens over the next decade. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. 
We have two more speakers left in this landscape talks. I just want to remind you that you can participate using Slido and just use Think Landscape as your tag. So our next speaker is Joanna Durbin, and she is the Director for Climate, Community, and Biodiversity Alliance. And she's going to talk to us about the Sustainable Landscape Rating Tool. Welcome. Thank you. So the Sustainable Landscape Rating Tool provides information to help facilitate and scale up investment in sustainable landscapes. So by this, I mean a place that's adopting a sustainable landscape approach. Uh, different stakeholders. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> different stakeholders across sectors and levels, um, government, farmers, businesses, landowners, indigenous peoples, NGOs, where they're working together to reconcile competing social, economic, and environmental objectives to meet agreed sustainable landscape goals through integrated land management. And when I refer to a jurisdictional approach, I mean, a place where this kind of approach, sustainable landscape approach, is implemented within an administrative boundary. We heard about uh, earlier some examples. Um, with active government engagement through supporting policies, laws, land use plans, uh, enforcement, etc. So these places with sustainable landscape and jurisdictional approaches can provide business opportunities. They can help commodity companies maintain the quantity and quality of the supply of their target commodity. They can help them to meet their zero deforestation or other sustainability commitments. They can help to reduce risks, reputational risk, for example. They can help investors find opportunities to invest in sustainable practices. Uh, with enhanced social and environmental impacts and reduced costs potentially of monitoring their investment impact and reduced financial and reputational risks. And the good news is that there are a lot of places where such approaches are being adopted. The Landscapes for People, Food and Nature initiative and um, identified more than 360 integrated landscape initiatives. We heard about 12 more uh, earlier. Um, and there are more than 50 states and provinces in tropical forest countries that are at different stages of adopting a jurisdictional approach. But how far have they got? And are they investment ready? So in order to make investment decisions, you need information uh, about maybe all sorts of things. So CCBA is working with 15 other organizations um, to clarify the types of information that they need and to make this information more accessible. And today I'm going to talk about a tool that helps with one type of those information, uh, the information on enabling conditions uh, that affect sustainability, things like the policies, laws, plans, land tenure clarity, the level of illegality in the region. Um, so, the Sustainable Landscape Rating Tool uh, is, helps with a rapid and objective assessment of jurisdictional policy and governance conditions. It provides information in a structured and easy to understand format on policy and governance risks um, for investors and, and commodity sourcing companies. And it helps the subnational governments and their partners to explain and communicate their progress in um, establishing these policy and governance conditions. So, uh, and our aim in developing the tool was to help create incentives for progressive reforms and strengthening of the, those conditions and leading to more sustainable landscapes. So the tool was developed by the Climate Community and Biodiversity Alliance, um, which is a partnership of NGOs and with its members, uh, Rainforest Alliance, Wildlife Conservation Society, um, and Conservation International. Um, and we partnered with Eco Agriculture Partners and the Global Canopy Program. Um, and uh, it was launched a year ago. So it includes, it includes uh, indicators, criterion indicators, for key policy and governance conditions. Things like, is there a land use plan? 
Does it cover the entire jurisdiction? Was it developed through a participatory process? Um, are there overlapping rights? Uh, are the protected areas adequately staffed and resourced? Uh, is there a multi-stakeholder coordination body? Are there, for example, extension services or financial support for sustainable practices? So the assessment is a, a kind of detailed uh, um, a, a approach with guidance for deciding on a rating um, and uh, you have to provide uh, justification and evidence and links to strategies, laws, reports and data to explain which level, the, which w w explain the rating. And then uh, in a scorecard it provides a summary um, and you get an A for high, full or clear, B is medium or partial and C is low or not addressed. So it's a way of bringing together complex information and making it readily and quickly understandable. So since it was launched uh, a year ago, it's being used in 45 different states, I think 45 states and provinces in tropical forest areas of the world. That's all the Amazon regions of Peru, uh, the Amazon states of Brazil, uh, six states in Mexico, seven provinces in Indonesia and others in Africa and Latin America. And this is being done, um, just being picked up and used with the support of C4, Earth Innovation Institute, Conservation International, Pro Natura Sur, and others. So we've had some interesting feedback. Uh, um, for example, from a workshop in Peru, where C4 uh, colleagues in Loreto um, heard from participants that they liked the way that it uh, made the information available in a very structured format for the general public. And the original government thought it was useful to evaluate strengths and address weaknesses. Um, NGOs thought it was useful to inform decision making and transparency. And the agriculture office was interested in, in attracting investment in sustainable production. So that was the original idea of it. And it's actually, if it's used in a participatory way, um, could not also be used within the landscape to help identify areas for strengthening. Um, and some felt it was important for the, to be used in a kind of self-assessment way, and others thought it would be more reliable um, and if it was used by an outsider. It can be used in all these ways, it's a tool. So it can be used for due diligence screening, uh, to identify potential red flag areas, and it's like a country credit rating, like an ease of doing business rating, but it's focused on landscape issues, and it's at sub-national level. Um, so we, this tool is focusing on enabling conditions. Uh, and as you know, there are many other things that uh, companies need information about, about progress towards sustainable landscape goals like deforestation, about investment opportunities. So we're collaborating with uh, some other organizations to, uh, to integrate this information from the tool on the policies and governance into, uh, with other information. Um, with the Earth Innovation Institute on the Governor's Climate and Forest uh, Impact Platform, with Conservation International on the Landscapes Assessment Framework, and with VERA and Rainforest Alliance on the Landscape Standard. So uh, and, and more, for more information, you can look on our website, climatestandards.org, and I'm here to talk more about it and answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. All right, we have one more speaker for our landscape talks this afternoon, and this is Walter Vergara, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about restoration investments in Latin America, and Walter is a senior fellow at the World Resources Institute, so welcome. Well, thank you, and thank you for the organization. I'm very pleased to be here, and I want to tell you in seven minutes or less what's happening with Initiative 2020 from the point of view of actual investments, experiences on the ground. Well, Initiative 20 by 20 is an effort led by 17 countries in Latin America to change the dynamics of land degradation in the region. 
these are the countries that are participating in 20 by 20, and you see there the ambitions that they have in terms of uh, restoration of land. Uh, the initial objective was to establish a goal of initiating restoration of 20 million hectares by 2020. Now we are at 50 million hectares. That's good, but that's just the ambition. More important, we've been able to capture the earmarks from 20 private impact investors and other financial institutions who have pledged $2.6 billion of private capital to participate in restoration in Latin America. This is just a collection of the logos of the platform. You see many, many logos. So something is going well because it's attracting a lot of attention. We have about 50 technical partners. We have 20 private investors, and we are working in collaboration with some of the large multinational banks and also other institutions. Now, because this uh, initiative was launched from the ground up, the definition of what enters into restoration has been provided by the countries themselves. And here you have the five windows of restoration entertained under 20 by 20. The commonality is restoring functionality of the land, restoring vegetation, carbon stocks, improving the quality of soil, restoring surface hydrology, restoring biodiversity. And these are the five windows that are being entertained. Landscape management, the first two, reforestation, grassland restoration, avoid the deforestation. The initiative has three activities. One is a political dialogue, which has been quite successful. The second is a technical effort, an analytical effort. The initiative has sponsored seven regional studies on topics that are of critical importance for restoration. But I want to talk to you about one activity, which is the actual investment in restoration in Latin America. And for that, the platform has created a financial architecture, which is summarized here. And I don't want to go into the detail, but I want to answer the question, is it working? Is this providing enough support for private impact investors in Latin America to invest in restoration? And if this, okay. And this is the first example. This is a project that shows that if you give nature a chance, it will heal itself. This is a project of ecological restoration in the Chacabuco Valley in Chile. 267,000 hectares, where Conservación Patagónica has invested above ground $5 million to allow, to impede additional degradation and allow nature to heal itself. This does, does not include the uh, cost of the land, and we don't have that number, but the amount of money that they have invested in lifting lenses, bringing the original fauna, assisting in reforestation is about $5 million. This is probably the largest ecological restoration project in Latin America, probably one of the largest in the planet. One second example on landscape management. This is a very exciting project by Caraná and Alianza Cacao Peru in three uh, provinces in Peru, working on 28,000 hectares of combination cacao and tropical high value native tree species. 18,000 new jobs have been created, $58 million have been invested. This project is fully in operation. Example number three, oops. Apparently example number three has been deleted. Okay, example number four, this is from Altilia. Altilia was here, he left, Christian left. But they are working on a very interesting project on grassland restoration and planting of some trees in about 10,000 hectares in Mato Grosso State in Brazil. And the important thing about this project is it has been so successful financially that they are now thinking about multiplying the total land area by an, by an order of magnitude. So I would prefer that Christian talks to you about it, but let's say that the next stage of this project will be in the 100,000 hectares range. Now, one more project, grassland restoration. Very interesting project in Chihuahua Desert. Remember, 
we're not talking only about forests. Forests are not the only biome that needs healing. Grassland restoration in Mexico, very important aspect to be tackled. There are three institutions working on 28,000 hectares with a little bit of money trying to change the behavior of the ranchers and with an immense biodiversity benefit, supporting the recovery of population of migratory bird species in the area. One more uh, example, this is by Kona 4, almost 1 million hectares of newly reforested land with an investment of about $410 million all over Mexico. We have very interesting footage with drones showing how these trees have survived and are being uh, planted all over the country. And Caspar, one of my favorites, here is a newly, new project, really uh, recently uh, uh, closed, which is restoration of secondary forests. Secondary forests also a very important case of restoration planet-wise. 6,000 hectares by the Forestry and Climate Change Fund. Caspar is right there. He can give you more details. Very interesting with indigenous communities. And lastly, avoided deforestation is the cheapest way to restore land, avoided degradation. And this project in Sierra El Divisor was launched a few months back here in Washington. 2.1 million hectares of newly protected land in the border between Brazil and Peru by the Andes Amazon Fund, and they are providing the resources to make this an effective, effective protected area. <clears throat> now, I want to spend 30 seconds on the Green Belt. The Green Belt was launched in Colombia two weeks ago by Minister Murillo in the context of Initiative 2020. This is a very ambitious effort. This is 9.2 million hectares forming a corridor that would link the borders of Brazil and Ecuador through Colombia to establish a barrier to prevent further degradation of the Amazon biome. It's a huge effort. Initiative 2020 is fully committed to support it, <clears throat> and we are working with uh, partners like Permian, with Steven, Artilia, the Andes Amazon Fund, and others to make it work. Now, the original goal was 20 million hectares under restoration. We're at 50. That's the goal right now. We started with $350 million of private investment capital. Now we have 2.6, and I think we'll reach 3 billion or north of that in a few months. It's time to set this stage further away. We want the next stage of Initiative 2020 to be 2050 by 2050, 250 by 2050. If we are able to engage partners in Latin America at this level of effort, 250 million hectares, will make a serious down payment on the carbon footprint of the region. This will equal about 60% of the total emissions of Latin America. I think with initiatives like this, we would be able to pay the down payment on a carbon-free regional economy. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. And thanks to all of our six speakers. That was, I learned a lot, and that was very inspiring and uplifting. I think it was a great way to spend a lunch hour. That wraps up the landscape talks for today, but we have uh, another set of discussion forums coming up at 1.30, so you have a couple minutes to get there. There's a session that's going to be in this room. Hosted